Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For, Lord, you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I'm of a certain age that my Christmases growing up were in black and white. At least that's what the pictures say. They were in black and white, and the movies were in black and white too. Some of you can remember that as well. Somewhere during the 60s, we got color cameras, and suddenly the, the memories became in color, not just black and white. But I wonder sometimes for us at Christmas time, with all the bright colors and sounds and, and the things that make us celebrate, maybe be happy, that there's some black and white in our lives too. There's some things that take the color out. And maybe it's not so bad to say bah humbug when someone says Merry Christmas, but for them, someone to say Merry Christmas, we go, for us, sometimes maybe it's not so merry. Maybe it's not so much the, the holiday that for, it is for other people. During these several weeks of Advent, we're kind of looking at Christmas through the lens of Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge, that old character, a miserly guy who was part of the Christmas Carol, written by Charles Dickens. And if you remember the story, he, he was told that he was going to be visited by, by three ghosts. Three people were going to let him look at his past, his present, and his future. And so in looking at that and keeping with that, this morning we're going to look at Christmas past. For just like in Scrooge, just like for any of us, our past determines a lot of our present. We kind of live out of our past. Some of us had great Christmases growing up. Others had maybe not so good. Lots of things happen in life and things happen to us and there's decisions we make. And there are things from our past that we carry with us today. I think sometimes you go up in the attic, you bring in all those boxes of, of decorations. That sometimes we bring down the, the Christmas baggage as well. That when we think about this Christmas, we're still flavored or touched by things from Christmas's past. And it comes kind of the baggage we carry with us. So as we look at Scrooge's visit to his past, maybe we can see something of our past too. Maybe in the light of Christ, we'll see both his past and our past maybe a, a little differently this morning. Or if you remember, the, the ghost took him back to his past, and the first thing you see is in a little classroom, a little boy all by himself. Now, he's probably at a boarding school. It was not untypical for both in Dickens' day, even present-day England in some places. For the kids to get the best education, you go to a private school, and those were often boarding schools. And so you have this little boy in the room that looks like all the other families have picked up their children. Everyone else has gone home for the holiday, but he's by himself, all alone. Don't know if he didn't really have many friends. We certainly know as an adult, Scrooge didn't have many friends. But maybe that started early. You know, some kids are just liked. Other kids are disliked. You remember your childhood. Maybe you were popular. Maybe you weren't so popular. Maybe you were chosen first when they picked teams for kickball or different things. Or maybe you were picked last or worse, well, you take them, I don't want them, kind of thing when captains chose. It says something about Scrooge's family life when he's there all by himself at Christmas time. Where's his mom and daddy? Where's his family? Some of us know what it's like to have parents that aren't there. I know that my family growing up was four sisters, or three sisters rather, and myself and mom and dad. And that's the way we kind of grew up. That's what we had together. Then in, in 1986, my parents separated and divorced. And even as an adult, though, it kind of changed. It kind of unraveled my past a little bit. It certainly changed my future. We never really have a Christmas together again, not like we had for years before. Well, some of you know what that's like. And some, for some of you, it's a much younger age, not as an adult. But as a child, your parents divorced or separated. And that kind of made things different for you because of that. For some, it's been difficult. I, I think of Lisa Jobs, you, you, Lisa Jobs. Lisa Jobs is the daughter of Steve Jobs, guy of Apple Computer. And as, when Lisa was born, kind of tells the way their, their life, their relationship started was the fact that he wanted to get DNA testing to make sure that she was really his child. When he was making $200 million a year with Apple, as it began to explode, he'd get $500 a month to to send a lease and her mother to take care of the child. You may not remember of all the different computers Apple made. One time they made a Lisa computer. The Lisa computer was the only project Apple really did that failed terribly. 
And that computer did not sell well. It was not a, a good thing. Well, Lisa kind of wondered if maybe that computer was named after her. Maybe her dad really did think about her. And as a young girl, she remembers the book Small Fry. It's kind of her telling of her story. She talks to her daddy, Stephen Jobs, and says, did you name that computer after me, Dad, the Lisa computer? He goes, no, no, I didn't do that. And just one more thing kind of, kind of hurt her. You know, all the time he wasn't there, all the different things that happens. It grows up with a famous parent or someone who's rich and busy and doesn't really have time for you. It was years later when she was 27, before D Steve Jobs passed away, they were on a, a, a trip together, her with lots of other family members. Another time for him to kind of reach out to her. And someone, they were at a meal together and someone else asked the question, Steve, did you name that computer after, after Lisa, that Lisa computer? And it says he got real quiet. He, and he just looked down at the table. And she was waiting to see what he'd say this time. And he said, yeah, yeah, I named it after Lisa. So that's all he had to say about it. She goes, Parva was thrilled to finally admit that there was a connection. He named a computer after her. Then part of the sadness was the fact she'd asked for years. And he denied it. But when some stranger, someone else asks him, then, then he admits to it. Family relationships are difficult, can be very complicated. And sometimes our growing up years as young children, it's, it may be a difficult time because of our parents. Some parents are, are home with us, but, well, they get a little too festive at Christmas, as they do maybe too often during the year. And, and alcohol gets a little too freely shared, and, and people get inebriated, get drunk, and some people get vicious when they're drunk, and some people just withdraw, and, and for some children growing up, Christmas was a scary time because they knew there'd be more drinking. Again, I don't know what's part of your growing up years. Some people had wonderful Christmases, but some people had difficult ones where they're lonely, where they're afraid, where parents are not the people they need to be, where fathers aren't the fathers they may need to be. The scene shifts with that ghost in Ebenezer's past, and they come to a scene with his sister, Fan. Now, Fan had, had died during the childbirth of his nephew, Fred. Fred, the one who greets him with a Merry Christmas, God save you, Uncle Scrooge, and to which he replied, Bah humbug. Fan's there, and she, she's telling him that I, I've talked to Daddy. He, Father, Father says you can come home now. Father says, you don't have to stay here. You can, you can come home. Now, this is years later, and maybe he's still at the school, and, and maybe he would go home. We don't really know from the scene whether he went home or not because sometimes, you know, enough time passes or things happen, and, and you don't care anymore. That becomes part of the Christmas past, too. You learn not to care. Maybe that's how Scrooge felt. We do know that suddenly he felt very panged with the, the feeling of knowing that his sister would would be dead when he was an adult. That's also something that sometimes clouds our Christmases are the, the people that aren't there. Maybe it's loved ones who are, are older, which we know it, it happens at times that, that people do pass away, grandparents and even parents as we get older. But sometimes things happen to people we care about when we're young and to young people. And there begins to be a, a hole. There's a place at the table that, that no one's sitting there. And so the Christmas past is, affects our future because there's, there's empty places. And that causes empty places in our hearts. And it's hard to be merry when you've got tears in your eyes and when there's an ache in your throat. And sometimes it comes from someone who died recently or maybe it's even years ago, but Christmas sometimes brings that out. And we may not say bah humbug, but it's hard to say Merry Christmas because there's an empty place inside us. It still hurts. Well, the last scene the ghost shows with, with Scrooge is with them at, uh, well, they do one show, one Mary scene at the Fezziwigs and, the, and all that going on. There's a great celebration. But it seems like just after that, there's a scene with him and a young lady. And the young lady's walking away from Scrooge because she said, you've made a choice. You made a choice that you love gold more than you love me. You, you want to be more about making money than about having a relationship. And maybe in the light of that scene, as he looks back at it as an adult, Scrooge realizes he may have made a terrible choice. Sometimes as we go through the years, things change because we made choices. 
And would that all the choices we made were good ones. But sometimes we make mistakes that are terrible, that affect our life and affect the lives of others. And, and we can't unchange it. And as the years go by, that regret, that decision, that disappointment, that sorrow because of what we've done stays with us and clouds everything. Even especially sometimes at Christmas, as the family gathers, we feel different, left out, because we know what we did and what we haven't done. See, again, Christmas past comes with lots of different things, like Christmas baggage, if you would, that we could try to carry. And it affects our ability to, to be celebrated, be thankful. It affects our ability to, to care about others because we've we got these holes inside. We've got these gaps. We've got these pains. But the thing we need to always remember at Christmas, whether Christmas past or Christmas present, is the fact that it's never meant to be about all the trappings, all the decorations, all the songs and the carols, even the, the parties or, or the festivities. It's about Jesus. 800 years before Jesus would come, the prophet Isaiah talks in the ninth chapter. He says, People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who live in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. There, there are people in dark places. That's that black and white world, maybe more black than white, maybe more sorrowful. People that live in dark, a light shining. There's a light that God wants to shine on your past, on those memories. The dark places, the painful places, the empty spaces. He wants a light to shine there. God's sending a light to shine. It says, you've multiplied the nation, increased its joy. They rejoice before you with joy at the harvest. That word joy appearing four times in this one verse. That that light that shines is meant to bring joy. To help take away the sadness. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. Verse 6 says, for a child has been born for us. A son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders. And his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall, be no end, there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom, he will establish and withhold, uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time on, onward, and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. For one's coming, who's the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What Isaiah is trying to say is that people in dark places, people with hurtful past, people with difficult struggles that they have to live with or try to live away from or don't know what to do with sometimes, they become overwhelming. He says God wants to shine a light, a light by which you can not only see yourself differently and see those memories differently, but also see that that light if you go back to the source of that light, it's a wonderful counselor that, that God wants to guide you through life and guide you through the difficult things, how to have a handle of them. Because baggage becomes heavy, but God doesn't change your past. You understand? God will not change your past. No one can change your past. What God does is change you and change your perspective on the past. What he can do is bring hope to situations that seems hopeless. And bring peace, the Prince of Peace, where there's anxiety and pain. He can bring healing because in his light, in his presence, there is life. And that life changes things. It can change our hearts and, and not change our past, but change who we are. This is the everlasting father to the, to the orphan child, to the one who feels alone, who's, the one whose parents were not the best parents or whose fathers were difficult and hurtful and maybe mean. He says, I'll be your father, an everlasting father, a father who will never leave you or forsake you. See, again, God is not a, a representation of our earthly fathers, but God rather is the perfect father for all children, no matter what their age is, whether nine years old or 99 years old. Because all of us need parents. All of us we need someone to care for us, who we who take care of so many people. And that's one of the big changes as an adult is all the responsibilities all the things you have to do. And yet, who takes care of you? God says, I want to remind you that I'm an everlasting father. I'll father you. I'll care for you. I see the tears you cry, even as an adult. 
I see the frustration and the pains. I, I see the past you carry with you. And I want to set you free from that. Not changing the past, but changing how you carry it. That you've got someone to help carry it with you. That you're not alone. Because he's a mighty God. He has the power and strength to do things we cannot do by ourselves. We cannot unleash ourselves from the past. But God can free us from the past that hurts us. Can change to new possibilities as he changes us and changes our perspective on life, on ourselves. See, light's the, the way we see things. We need light to see things. If not, we just see things darkly. Don't understand. But one of the things that God wants to do is change our vision, change our perspective. He helps us look up because he's the gift that comes down from above. John said in his gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And everything that came to being through him, everything that was created came to being through him. In him was life, and that life is the light for all people. Interesting that life, his life, brings light. And with that light brings hope and joy and peace and love. In that life is all God wants to give us, and, it, and he wants us to see it. And so he sends light. He says that light comes in the world, and the darkness cannot overcome it cannot conquer it, cannot understand it, different translations say. Because God's light's always strong in the darkness, in the darkness of our past and our struggles. He says he came to his own and his own didn't receive him. He came to his own people and they didn't recognize him. That's often the case that at Christmas time we, we miss Jesus. We miss the one who's coming to give us light and give us life and all that we need. We, we don't see it. But he says, the many has received him, who believed in his name, who, who received the gift that God wants to give us in Christ at Christmas. And it says he gave them the power, the right to be called children of God. Now they're God's children. They're loved by an everlasting father. There's a prince of peace who's with them. There's a mighty God to fight for them. They're not alone. And a wonderful counselor to help guide them through life and, and the pitfalls and the problems and the decisions a God of grace and hope and says we beheld him as one begotten of the only full of glory the only son of the father full of grace and truth the truth God wants us to hear this morning is of his great love for us of his light that he wants to shine in our lives that we can see our past in a different perspective that the things that hurt that he can begin to heal those. The empty places he can begin to feel. That the word hope will become alive to us. The word joy will become something we experience. That peace will help us lay down our heads at night and not be worried or anxious about tomorrow. That we can be different people because mighty God is with us. And God's grace is there to forgive us. This season of Advent, this time of Christmas is a wondrous time because every day can be a wondrous day if you know who you are and whose you are. If you know you're a child of God, loved by God, you have an everlasting father, a mighty God, a prince of peace, a wonderful counselor. In the light of knowing that God's with you, you can take your life and say, Lord, here's this past. I don't know what to do with it. And God can help. Lord, I don't know. I made those decisions and I feel like I've messed things up beyond repair that God can give you a new beginning, make a new way to go, can guide your way. Sometimes it may make an additional phone call, a visit, a letter. Sometimes it is letting go. Sometimes, for many times, it's, it's taking on helping other people to lift our perspective up from ourselves and being consumed with ourselves. Scrooge's world was very small. It was centered on him. But God wants us to see a whole world of people that you can care about, that you can make a difference for, that what was absent in your life, you can give to someone else because you're there, because you show up, because you make an effort. Christmas is a wondrous time of year. And I pray for all of us that whatever our past was like, maybe again we had a joyful past and wonderful and all these things are good. That is great. But I worry for those who carry the burden or the trials of Christmas past. 
to this day you may know a light's going to shine and is available to shine to help see things differently and see yourself differently and see your present and your future with hope and life because of Christ. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, help love your children this morning that we might know it. Wonderful counselor, guide our way when we don't know what to do or say. Mighty God, help move our past in such a way that we are no longer bound to it, but can live away from it or live a different life because you give us the opportunity and this grace and strength to do it. And Prince of Peace, be the peace in our hearts that we can truly rest in you and enjoy the season for what it is and receive the gifts you give and share them with others. That life will be different in the present because of how you help us with our past. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.